Awesome. Thanks, everyone, and welcome to the session today. Um, today, we're going to be talking about architecting a security data lake at scale. So why is this important? The shift from the security data focuses on upstream data to give the people the data where they need and to better give them insights into the discovery of relationships between despair, um, data sources that exist within their organization. So I'd like to run through a quick agenda. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about who we are, why are you listening to us, and why does it matter. Um, the difference between a data warehouse, a data lake, and a data fabric. A lot of new terms that people like to throw around nowadays. <laughs> Data maturity, so where are you out within your journey and how do you accelerate that? Implementation of a data fabric, transforming your data lake internally, the core capabilities of a data fabric that we've utilized at Comcast, where we are today and how that can help you. So at Comcast, we know a thing or two about the security data problem. Um, we have roughly 10 petabytes of security data within our data lake. We have seven different multi-cloud slash hybrid cloud solutions across the organization. We have roughly 18 million IP addresses that get targeted monthly in our discovery scans. We have over 534 Xfinity stores that exist within the network. And then we have 544 third-party connections that exist as well. So we know a lot about data <laughs> and getting data into a platform. But data can be messy, and there can be a lot of it. So you have to be able to make noise, sense out of the noise that exists. And so how do you do that is by creating these three different areas within your business. The first one is the data infrastructure. So you have a data warehouse, a data lake, and a data fabric. With the data warehouse, what you're really focusing there is identifying the key data sources that are utilized across your organization. Your endpoint, your organizational data, your asset data, your hierarchy, who is the data owner of each one of those organizations, of uh, those data products? The second one is the data lake. So bringing that data using ETL and data management pipelines to transform it and normalize it into a consistent and cohesive manner to make insights out of. And then lastly is the data fabric, which is what the new up and coming technology is, where you create that layer of abstraction that allows you to add the business context to your data lake and to what you have stored within your data warehouse so that each of the different business units can make sense of the data where they are along with their journey. At Comcast, we started our journey about five and a half years ago to build out our security data lake. When we first started it, we were very much in the aware and reactive zone. We would have a threat or we would notice a vulnerability, and rather than being proactive and enabled and informed within those decisions, we had to react and we weren't always aware of what was going on. And so what we did is we built the security data fabric. And so within this, we were able to move from the aware within our left side to prescripted and enabled, which is where we are today. Depending on where you are within your journey, you might be closer to that aware stage or enabled or even prescriptive, depending on if you how your data is structured within your organization. A lot of companies that we've talked with fall closer into that aware and reactive zone. So with that, you have your strategic value. It's very hard to get. It's very hard to explain, hey, we need money for our security data lake. Security is typically the last thing to get funding. So how do you actually do that? You move closer on your maturity journey so that you can get to that enablement and that prescriptive, and folks are seeing real insight and real value out of what they're giving you the money for. And so when you're in the aware zone, you have no centralized data management. You have no data strategy or very little data strategy that exists. Um, your data is very siloed within your organization. You don't have one cohesive place where all of your security data, all of your organization data lives, and that different areas of the business, whether it's governance, risk, compliance, the security, the threat hunters can all live and utilize the same data based off of what their use cases are. From there, you move more into that reactive stage, which is where you have data warehousing. You start to have that data strategy, but it's not as advanced as what you would typically have when you have it in the informed stage. So your data still remains largely siloed, but you have this idea where you start to bring an effort of all of your data manipulation within one team, within one group. And so you have multiple different schemas where you're showcasing multiple different versions of the truth. So someone has a report over in GRC that's showcasing, I have 500 scans today, and someone has another report that's manually on their desktop using an Excel file that's showing, I have 325, but I maintained that file for three years, so I trust that file over your scan file. 
So you have to be able to move to that informed stage, which is where you're, you're connecting the data and the integra integrated value views and data sources together. And what that allows you to do is get that 360 degree data entity view, um, as well as proactive reporting. So rather than being reactive, waiting for something to happen, you're able to look and say, okay, here's where we are today, here's where we're not meeting our threshold, we're not meeting our controls, and take action on that then and there. Which then leads into the enablement stage. So you're starting to actually unlock the full potential of the data and the insights. You're able to automate your data pipeline and infrastructure. You're able to solve complex business problems um, using advanced use cases such as threat hunting, as well as like entity correlation throughout that. And then once you get super advanced, you're moved into that prescriptive stage, which is where we are today at Comcast, where we're actually starting to be powered by AI and ML. Um, so having the ability to have chatbots reach out to you and say, hey, we noticed that this is an unidentified asset. This asset does not have an owner within your CMDB. Can you reach out to that individual who's logged into the box, and maybe not the owner, but we think it's the owner, and say, hey, we noticed you logged into this box on Tuesday at 5 p.m. Are you the owner? Most likely you're going to say, no, I don't want to care, that's a chat bot. Like, don't want to answer that. However, then we can say, well, you logged in at 5 p.m., you touched this application via this asset. Are you sure you're not the owner? So we start to give you context clues, and you have to prove to us that you are not the owner in that case, because we have identified that you are the owner using the AI and ML. So how do you move across that security data journey? Um, the first one is you need to identify your key data sources. So what is important within your organization? Is it your EDR compliance, your vulnerability, your asset management, your policy exceptions? What are those key controls that exist and what data sources feed those key controls? From there, you need to develop the data pipeline. So you need to utilize ETL and data management pipelines to transform that into a cohesive manner um, and build it into a normalized semantic layer. What we mean by that is create a layer of abstraction that allows the business to use the data for each of the contexts that they're looking for. And so you have a normalized schema, whether that's OCSF, MITRE CAR, something you've developed internally, but all of the data that's getting piped through your system is living in one normalized schema that everyone knows how to utilize. And then you, at the core of this, you want to make sure that you have the integration of data quality. So creating safeguards for quality data to ensure trust among users. If you have that individual who's maintained that Excel file for the last three years, you have to move them off of that Excel file and into your data platform. So they have to have trust in the data, exposing how was it sourced, how often is it sourced, who sourced it, what's the definition of that control. And exposing that out really allows the enables the users to say, yes, I actually trust that now more than I trust my Excel file. So what we've done at Comcast is we've actually implemented the data fabric to transform your security data, and we've created a go-to-market solution called DataBee. And so with data, what we do is we actually extract the data from multiple different sources, what you saw on your left-hand side. We auto-parse that, flatten it, and normalize it, um, both large structured and semi-unstructured data. We then have a mapping and entity correlation model that is patented, that we map it into the OCF schema, which is a large partner of AWS, and then we load that into your data lake of choice. So whether that's Snowflake, Databricks, um, or some other cloud platform. And within that loading step, the data is enriched um, to make it more searchable and usable while stored accessibly in a cost-effective manner. So it'd be really hard for you to store your data for 12 months, as well as cost and effective, to store it for more than 12 months within your SIM or SOAR, such as Splunk. If you need to be able to do threat hunting and you, maybe you identified a vulnerability that existed within the network, but you want to look back and say, okay, did that threat actor branch out any time over the last 12 months? it's going to be really hard to look at that or very cost ineffective to do that within your SIMASOR. With a data lake, you're able to do that on a cost-effective approach as well as quickly search it. And with the DataBee platform, we enable that as well. So at Comcast, we've been on our security journey, like I had mentioned, for about five and a half years. Within this, um, we took it from all the way at the raw data into that very visualized, contextual, enabled for each of the different business units. So the way that we did this is we met the customers where they are. You want to make sure that if you're talking to a threat hunter, they're familiar with Databricks and writing code. But if you're talking to someone in GRC, they might not know how to write SQL or even Python or PySpark. So you want to make sure you're meeting them where they are. And so depending on your technical expertise, you're going to move up or down this pyramid. 
as well as the level of data filtering. So we're going to bring in all the data that's stored, um, whether it's on-prem on -prem or cloud services, from its, from its raw format, we store all of that in S3. It then moves into the next step, step of the pipeline, which is Databricks. That's where we do all of our flattening and ETL. So we flatten the da data for the machine learning uh, models to process via Spark jobs. This is where a lot of times the threat hunters, they'll live within this layer because they're very technical. They want to be able to search across multiple to different domains. The next layer is that data, uh, Snowflake. So that's where our normalized data lives. So we have our schema, uh, in this case OCSF, where we contextualize and we make it very easy for, say, a GRC analyst or a GRC engineer to do rapid search over 365 days or more within the platform. We do have Splunk kind of in the middle of this pyramid, but I actually like to take it out. So Splunk is living from the raw data. It, we can feed the data directly from there. However, why we have it in the pyramid is because if you keep it within the pyramid, what you're able to do is add in rich context to that. So if you have an alert that gets sent to your SIM or SOAR, and you look at your data lake and you've been looking at it and it has more data in Snowflake that's been normalized and contextualized, you can send that and enhance your alert. And so that's why it lives within this area of the pyramid. And then lastly, we have Tableau. You can use Power BI, whatever your visualization tool of choice is. Um, and that's where we have interactive dashboards and reporting capabilities that get built on top of it. Again, meeting the customer where they are within their journey. So what does this enable? Um, there's several core capabilities that a data fabric enables. Um, the first one that I like to call out, and it's maybe not the prettiest, is continuous controls monitoring. How many folks get hit up with audits and GRC questions quarterly, monthly? Awesome, I see a couple hands. <laughs> so continuous controls monitoring. If you look at conditional or traditional compliance compared to compliance today, if you don't have continuous compliance, your drift from compliance over time will drift from what your state is, and then when the audit comes, you're very shocked by those results. With the data fabric, you actually enable the continuous controls monitoring. Um, because it's built on the data fabric where you have the key security data components, the use cases that you've identified in that very first pillar. The next one is data science models. So data science models where we utilize machine learning, artificial intelligence to detect malicious um, and anomalous behavior. To, uh, and then also alerting. So the alerting is built on AI and ML as well, where we take that data and send it to the SIM, but then we add contextual alerts to it as well. Login coverage, um, so we want to make sure that our enterprise is secure. Um, we ingest several terabytes of data daily from over 100 sources, so we want to make sure we have login coverage across each one of those. Um, the next one is the normalized OCSF schema. Again, that's something that's utilized by AWS. It's essential to providing analytics and other cyber capabilities across the enterprise because you have one set way that the data is going to live and that people are going to interact with it. Um, the last one is, in, uh, there's several others, but the one I want to call out here as well is interactive notebooks. So we have interactive notebooks that are built on Databricks that allow you to do rapid search capabilities across the data sources for numerous stakeholders, whether that's incident response, threat hunting, and security teams. And so again, these interactive notebooks allows you to do a longer tail search than what you would have within your SIM and SOAR for a more cost-effective approach. So it talks a little bit about continuous controls monitoring. Um, within the DataB solution, or within a data fabric, what you actually enable is this ability to have a continuous controls framework. And so in this case, we're aligned to the NIST uh, 4.0 and PCI 2.0 that's launching next year. And we've identified the core controls where we have, um, there's a, more below the screenshot, but identify, protect, and detect. And so we have the controls that live underneath those, asset management, TPSA, phishing, endpoint detection, and response. What we're able to do and see here is, what is our coverage? How are we doing? What's our, what's our target within that? And then how are we historically trending over time? Within this as well, um, it's not able to see in the screenshot, but when you hover over each one of those percentages, we're telling you what the definition of that control is. Where was it sourced from? How often is it updated? Who's the data owner? Who's the BISO for that specific control? So again, meeting the customer where they are. We also have role level security enabled on this. So if I was Aaron Ham and I was logging in, I'm only going to see the direct reports that report to me. However, if I am our CISO and she's logging in, she's going to see everyone underneath her. So how can this help you? Um, I like to break it up into four key pillars. One, reduce cost. We talked a little bit about that. 
Second, real-time insights. Um, third, a single interface for folks to interact with. And then lastly, there's endless opportunities. So we've talked about a little bit here um, with automation, AI, ML, holistic analytics and insights. But what we actually do by building a security data fabric is you're creating a reusable infrastructure that not only can you use for security data, but you can expand that to other areas of your organization as well. So working with your major uh, data area, creating a quality control plane, a unified governance, embedded analytics, um, creating streamlined trigger actions and predictions that are going to exist within the network. And then again, storing all that data within a single repository. So how can we actually help accelerate your security data lake journey um, investment? Comcast has actually created a go-to-market solution called Databee, where we take all of your data, whether it's your security tools, asset data, organizational data, your business logic, internal policies, your definitions of a specific control, again, whether it's on cloud or on-prem, we ingest that into the DataB platform as a pass-through. We do not store your data. A lot of companies do not want to send your data to another platform. We don't want to own your data either. So it's just going to pass through the DataB platform. Within the DataB platform, we're going to ingest it, enrich it, auto-parse it, flatten it, normalize it to the OCSF schema, enrich it with your business context. So if you're looking at your EDR protection and you're saying, I don't care about cloud assets that exist within this specific area of my network because they're going to have a separate tool installed. You can apply that definition within the product. And then we land it again into your data lake of choice, whether that's Snowflake, Databricks, AWS. And then we have different modules, like the one you had saw before with the continuous controls monitoring, that we've built on top of it, whether it's in Tableau and Power BI. Again, meeting the customer where they are within their journey. We also take that data and send it directly into your SIM or store, and then we have a user interface where you can monitor all that data as well. So with that, I do want to call out, we will be having a happy hour tonight um, at the Electra and the Aviation at 8 p.m. Um, and appreciate everyone's coming to the t session and talk today.